Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I know some people are still filing in, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I am Noah Barnes. I'm the Communications Director at Plugin America. And before we get started, I just want to point out a couple of the features on this webinar. Um, if at some point during the presentation you have a question for our presenters, please submit your questions using the Q&A function on your screen, um, and we'll save some time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. There is also a chat function. I see some of you are, are already chatting with each other, so that's fantastic. Please uh, use the chat function to chat and the Q&A function for, for asking questions of the panelists. Um, and we also want to get started with a quick poll. So um, I'm going to um, launch a quick poll. We want to know how long have you been an EV driver? So um, please mark on this poll how long you've been driving an EV. Um, this is an anonymous poll, so if you're not currently driving an EV, you can uh, let us know that as well. Um, I see a lot of answers coming in, so we'll give it just a couple more seconds. Okay. So it looks like 31% uh, of you have been driving an EV for less than three years, and then we have a number of people who have been driving for four to six years, seven to nine years, uh, even 7% of you have been driving an EV for over a decade, so that's fantastic. And it looks like we have 22% of you who are still driving a gasoline vehicle, that's okay, but we hope you will uh, switch to an electric vehicle soon. So with that, I want to introduce Plug in America's Executive Director, Joel Levin. Thank you, Noah. Uh, so I wanna welcome all of the participants on the Zoom. Uh, so this is the kickoff for a quarterly series of webinars that Plug in America is launching to talk about various EV topics from the perspective of EV drivers. So Plug in America, probably you, most of you know us pretty well, uh, we're the national consumer voice for electric vehicles. And these webinars are free and open to the public, but we invite people to get more involved with our programs, to follow us on social media, to attend National Drive Electric Week, which is coming up uh, in September, uh, to participate in our policy action alerts and to contribute financially uh, if you're able to do so. Uh, we have close to 500 people um, on the Zoom with us today, which is pretty extraordinary. Uh, it goes well beyond our expectations for this call. And uh, I think it shows that there's a real excitement uh, to learn about what's going on with EVs in Europe and, and what's possible, uh, particularly given the, the hostility, I guess, uh, to EVs that we see from our own government. So um, I wanna welcome the three panelists today from EV drivers associations around Europe. Uh, we have Ellen Heap from the Dutch Electric Vehicle Drivers Association, uh, Christina Boo, from the Norwegian Electric Vehicle Association, and Alistair Hamilton from the Electric Vehicle Association of Scotland. Uh, all of these groups are members of the Global EV Drivers Network, which links together EV drivers, uh, EV driver associations from around the world. Uh, the network got started uh, at the initiative of Christina and the Norwegian Association. So shout out to, to you, Christina. And uh, we're always looking for uh, more EV driver associations to join us and to build our strength. So if you know about other driver associations around the world, you know, please, uh, please send them our way. So with that, uh, let's get started with Ellen. So Ellen, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Joel, for the introduction and uh, very honored that uh, we are here and that we can speak with you all. Uh, I, could, I, I had a look at the participants list, so I'm really glad. I, I see some familiar names and faces, so I'm really glad to uh, tell you something about what's happening at this moment in the Netherlands, you know, in those crazy COVID-19 times. And um, what I will do is I'll first explain a bit about um, who we are, just a short uh, slide. And then we're going to talk about uh, the current situation, uh, what about sales and charging. And then I'm going to talk about some news we've got and um, some results that we, we've, uh, I want to present you from a recent charging um, 
survey that we did in the last months. So um, if you can go to the next slide, Noah, thank you. Um, we, who are we? Uh, for the people that speak Dutch, I'm part of the Vereniging Elektrische Rijders. It's the EV Drivers Association in the Netherlands. We're here since 2014. And we sort of um, uh, made this association when we, after a visit to Norway and when we were very inspired by the Norwegian uh, organization. So thank you, Christina, for your inspiration. That's why we started our own uh, association in the Netherlands. We've got 6,000 members and growing, and we've got a very lively Facebook group and lively premium member group. So we're very happy with everything that's happening. And what we're doing is focusing on information, building a community, you know, information about seeing how fake news and real news uh, can be um, uh, shown to the public and what's real about electric driving and what should you know as, if you want to drive electric. Uh, building a good community and lobby is very uh, important, especially now because our Dutch policies are changing a bit. So next slide, please. Um, if, if we go to have a look at the situation in the Netherlands, and you can go to the next slide immediately. This is uh, the situation uh, since last month. So this, the figures include May 2020. So what you see is you see a green line with a steep curve, like a sort of COVID-19 curve. Um, those are the electric vehicles, and we've, about, we've got about 100, 120,000 electric vehicles. The other one, it's the sort of light blue, um, is the plug-in hybrid. And what you can see is that our plug-in hybrids are like um, at a solid state now. And one of the reasons, and you can see that in 2016, is that in 2016 our government stopped subsidizing plug-in hybrids. So you can see as a result that they're not longer sold. Well, they are sold, but they're not very popular at this moment. And but full electric is being subsidized now fully. So that's why you see. Uh, steep curve. Next slide please uh, Noah. Um, just to get an impression what are, are the most popular models, uh, well we are, um, uh, we like the Teslas and I think in the last quarter of 2019 I think we had about the most sold Model 3s outside of the US or something and I, we had an incredibly you know there were boats and boats and boats with loads of Tesla Model 3s coming out and we expect to have that again at the next of at the end of this year because our subsidies will change after the after this year so we expect another big amount of uh, sales next slide please uh, noah uh, this is an impression of our charging points if you have a look at those lists it's all the public or semi public charging so you see we've got about 60000 charging points in the netherlands and the yellow dot on the, on the top of it is uh, those are the fast charging. And this is only public, so there's also a lot of private. I think there's about 120,000 private charging points as well. So we are sort of lucky to have a good uh, charging infrastructure in the Netherlands. And that's logical, we are a small country, but uh, well connected with the electricity network. So um, that, that helps by building a good infrastructure. Next slide, please. Um, and we're also happy that um, if you look at the charging density, I think uh, we're sort of proud that uh, um, there's a lot of charging points. So that for that, it means that at least uh, if you buy an electric car, uh, we will have uh, good opportunities for charging. And um, that's one of the most important things that people, uh, the barriers that we take away for people to buy and get in interested in uh, electric cars. Next one, please. <laughs> okay, what's happening at this moment? We've got a couple of things going on. Um, we've got a new subsidy from the Dutch government on electric cars. Um, before now, all our subsidies were mostly on business cars. So it wasn't really a subsidy, but it was a sort of a tax reduction. So that means that most of the electric cars driving on the Dutch motorways are business owned or are private, uh, are owned by um, self-employed people. So people that could have benefits from tax reduction. But that is going to change after the 1st of July. For the first time ever, the Dutch government is going to give private subsidies to people that privately want to own, buy 
or lease an electric car. And it's uh, for the used cars or the new cars. So that is sort of a new uh, phenomenon. And uh, we already noticed that, that there's so much interest in that. And there's only a certain amount of money. So we urge people to buy now because it's, um, it's interesting uh, to uh, take care of that one now. Um, but what you also can see that there's a sort of a price war on electric cars now because uh, like big uh, uh, OEMs like um, Nissan and uh, Renault, they are doubling that subsidy. So they really want to sort of make this year with uh, the car sales not being uh, too good, making it a good EV car sales year. So we're happy to do that. Um, We've also had some webinars on hot topics like multi-dwelling houses and security issues. So those are big issues for us. If you're interested in that, just give me uh, a chat or give me an, an email. I can tell you more about it. And what we see, two of the big things that are happening in the Dutch streets now is that car sharing is booming. We see loads of new initiative of people sharing their car because, of course, it's, it will be difficult to go into public transport and if you don't have the money to buy a new car, you go into car sharing. And we can see that there's a better EV sales relatively than ICE cars. So sort of EV sales is sort of supply uh, driven. So the, the cars that are being on the market are mostly being sold as well. Next slide, please. Um, we just finished our largest Dutch charging survey and we've all we've had about 2,000 people participating in this survey. Um, it's not published yet, um, so this is a bit of a sneak preview. I was allowed to give away some of the sneaks. Um, and there will be a webinar on July the 4th, 13th. Uh, it will be in Dutch though, so it's for the people that can learn Dutch and, uh, within the next coming three weeks. And otherwise we might be able to sort of translate it for you. So please feel free to contact me if you're interested. There's five things that we see um, from the Dutch electric vehicle drivers. They drive a lot. They drive so much more than uh, fossil fuel uh, cars, about twice as much. So that is sort of, we didn't expect that, but that's what we saw. Uh, we've seen we've see that the charging mix, that the number of people that publicly charge or fast charge or charge at home is different than we thought. So there is much more public charging and less fast charging than we expected. And that means that uh, in the Netherlands, you know, in the, the policy makers are going to change their policy because um, uh, this is like an insight that we didn't have before. One of the other things is that uh, EV drivers don't have any range anxiety. Uh, they don't, uh, and on the other hand, the, 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 the charging speed is key. So there's more people concerned about their charging speed. And uh, in our survey, we saw that about 55% of the people were disappointed about the charging speed. And, you would, and that's, I think, a logical conclusion that um, if, if you don't care about how big your battery is, but if you can charge quickly, it is refueled quickly and you can um, go on with your travel quickly. Price transparency is a big issue. About 60% of the people had no clue what they pay before they go charge. And that is a big issue that we need to solve. And the top three problems with public charging is that um, not knowing what the costs are. There's not enough charging points. Even in our country, there's not enough charging points. And uh, they're complaining about this, the charging speed. That's the three main topics. And uh, what we also see is that charging points are taken by fossil fuel cars or electric cars that are, are not charging. And that's a big frustration because unlike in the US, um, we don't have um, uh, unlocked charging. So our charging is locked. So if there's a car attached to the charging point, you cannot take it away. So you have to wait until the people, the person in before you is taking the charge cord out of the charging station. And we carry our own charging cords in the car. So that's another thing. But that's a big uh, hinder for the, um, uh, for the EV drivers. Um, all this charging uh, survey is um, sort of giving yeah. us an insight what we want as EV drivers. And maybe you can go to the last slide, Noah. I think what we want is a sort of a 
sort of international rights of the EV driver. We're working on it. Our minister is, has just sent a letter to the EU, the European Union, about uh, battery checks. And I think we so should have, um, you know, work with all the countries together to see what we can do. Because, of course, in the Netherlands, it's a small country. We're very much uh, uh, relying on what's happening abroad. So for us, it's interesting what happens abroad. So we've got six points, and um, if you do, if you want to join us as Dutch electric vehicle drivers, you're very welcome to join us on this battle or fight or uh, uh, wish list, as, if you uh, want to uh, mention it that way. We think that every consumer should have a uniform and simple battery check check when purchasing an, an used EV. The other thing is that we think um, cross border charging in the whole of Europe should be possible with transparent prices. We think we should work on charging speed, so there should be more information about the charging speed before you charge. One of the things that we would like is a fast charger every 50 kilometers on the motorways throughout Europe. And we also need clear road signs where, to ch where you can charge and where not. And one of the other important thing is um, we should think that EV drivers should own their own data. So those are the six points we want to address to Europe. And of course, for the American viewers, that is maybe a bit um, far-fetched because you're not in the European uh, motorway system, but it might, um, it might uh, inspire you to have similar uh, wishes for your own state government or federal government. Um, well, this is what I wanted to um, speak to you and give you some insights from the Netherlands. And I'm very curious about, uh, about your questions or uh, about remarks or ideas that you might have to, uh, to uh, get EVs um, to electrify the Netherlands further. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess it's my turn. I didn't really hear you, Noah, but uh, um, I'll just <laughs> jump into it. My name is Christina Bu, and I head the Norwegian Electric Vehicle Association. Uh, very happy to speak to you tonight. The, it's, it's the night here in Norway, uh, but of course it's light outside. We're far north. Um, you can switch the slide. Uh, first, a little bit about us. We're a non-profit NGO. Uh, we are 25 years old this year, so we've been around for many years. Uh, currently, more than 75,000 EV drivers are members with us, paying members, so that's how we're funded. We are more than 35 employees, actually, I think we're 37 now. Um, and we are a consumer organization, but we do collaborate with industry. Uh, we think that that's important. If we are to, to sort of uh, succeed, we need to work together to make it happen. And uh, our goal is simple. We want to electrify transport as fast as possible uh, because this cuts emission, emissions, both lo local and, and global emissions. The, EV, the Norwegian EV Association is, is, um, has for many years been a strong lobbyist working politically uh, with communication like Ellen was talking about, uh, the myths and the discussions. We've been in those discussions for years and that I think has been very important in Norway that there are, there's an organization there with the facts and the figures uh, debating, uh, debating this. Um, we are also doing a lot to help our members uh, and uh, with membership um, uh, yeah, deals, for example. One thing is the RFID tag that you see on the photo, which make it possible for uh, all of our members to charge at any operator in Norway and, and actually now also in the Nordic countries. Um, we've also developed an app uh, which, which has an overview of all the chargers. Um, a lot of different things like this, um, which makes it uh, simpler for people and which is also a big reason why we have a lot of members. Okay, next slide. Uh, so why Norway? That's a little bit, uh, that is a bit of a good question because Norway is a long, cold country far uh, at the north. 
and uh, and that means that um, well, I, if if I mean if Norway can do it, if Norway can succeed, any country can. We are currently at 300,000 fully electric cars in Norway. I, when I talk about EVs, I'm talking about fully electric. In my opinion, a plug-in hybrid is not an electric vehicle. It's a part, partly an electric vehicle, but it's not an EV. So that's why I, I keep PHEVs uh, on the side. Um, 300,000 fully electric and 125,000 PHEVs in Norway. Next slide. And if you look at the market shares, I think, the most interesting thing with the Norwegian development is how fast this has happened. Back in 2012, the market share was 3%. Uh, by May this year, it's almost 50. So 50, one in every second person that purchases a, a new car in Norway uh, buys, a, buys a full electric one. 20% 20 per, 20 a plug-in hybrid. Uh, with light commercial vehicles, it's not uh, this, not as good. We're at seven percent, but it's expected to rise because more cars are uh, possible to buy. Next slide. Uh, I'd also like to show you this map of Norway, and because a lot of people still talk about electric cars as something for the cities. And yes, uh, the market shares are higher in the sort of city areas. Oslo, the capital, uh, these are the different counties in Norway. Uh, and, uh, and it started in the cities, but today the electric cars are, are sold all over the country. Even Nuland County, the neck of Norway, that's actually where the polar circle cuts through Norway. It's pretty cold. Even Nuland has a market share of 35%. Uh, but it varies a little bit also because of uh, local uh, in, uh, incentives. Uh, some of the local incentives we have nationally are more present in some areas than others. For example, uh, lower tolls, uh, which we don't have many tolls in the north, for example, in, in the very north. Toll roads I'm talking about. Okay, next slide. I thought I'd also include uh, our neighbors and our neighbor, the Nordic countries, because it's actually also moving in uh, in uh, in some of these countries as well, especially Sweden. They have a market share. This is the first quarter this year uh, of nine percent for EVs, and Iceland is actually second in Europe with thirty-two percent. Iceland is a small country, but Sweden is actually quite a lot bigger than Norway when it comes to the mountain uh, the inhabitants. And if you look at the percentage change, it's pretty. Uh, it's actually only Norway that has gone back a little bit, but. The reason why Norway has uh, is a bit uh, lower sales first quarter this year than last year is because March last year was when the Tesla Model 3 started deliveries in Norway and Norwegians bought a lot of Tesla Model 3s. Next slide, please. Okay, you can just continue. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the politics in Norway and uh, uh, it's often uh, misunderstood and a lot of people think that we are subsidizing the purchase of EVs. But what Norway is doing is no different than what some states in the US is doing for every car. Because you don't have, in, there are a few states I guess in the, I heard that in the US that does not have a VAT and definitely don't have purchase taxes which we have in Norway. Norway is one of the few countries that has a huge tax on the purchase of, of cars. So we tax ICE cars pretty heavily. This is just an example, but the tax is, is uh, put on a car according to the weight and the emissions of the car. An EV, a full electric car, does not have a purchase tax or uh, any VAT. And that's how these cars compete in Norway. Buying an electric car is more or less the same price as buying an equivalent ICE car. So we're not subsidizing, we're just not taxing, but we're actually uh, taxing ICE cars heavily. And that is, I think, I know that it will be difficult for most countries to do what Norway's done because we've had a long, we have a long history of taxing cars. And we're a social democratic part, uh, country with, with uh, high taxes in general. But um, in my opinion, what more countries can do is to introduce a system where they at least put some taxes on the most, uh, most polluting cars and use that money to 
to subsidize uh, EVs. And that is something, for example, France has started and even Sweden started that 1st of July 2018. And that's why you see the sales going up in Sweden. Next slide, please. In addition to those, uh, those tax exemptions, which is the most important uh, thing, because as a for a consumer, it's very difficult to, to pay up loads more for a new technology that you're even unsure of, maybe. In Norway, uh, the price is more or less evil, and that's the most important. But in addition to this, we have, had, we have quite a few local uh, in incentives as well, which has been important. Um, uh, I think, especially in the beginning, access to bus lanes uh, coming into Oslo, things like that. But uh, most uh, importantly, has been uh, uh, the first uh, exemption from, you, you haven't had to pay tolls at toll roads, public parking, and to have a car on the ferry. We have lots of ferries, especially on the west coast of Norway. Today it's 50%, but it used to be uh, totally free. So those local incentives has definitely been important too. Uh, and today um, an electric car pays maximum 50% of what an ice car pays. So it's still, a quite a big difference. Next slide, please. And I thought also I'd tell you a little bit about the Norway 2025 goal. Um, it says that all new passenger cars and light commercial vehicles that, uh, that are sold from 2025 shall be zero emission vehicles, which means we have to go from 50% to 100% uh, in less than five years. And I believe it's possible. So all of Norwegian, the Norwegian politics are really uh, directed at the purchase of new cars. And the faster you get to 100%, the fast, faster the emissions come down. Because it's very difficult to start doing something with the second-hand cars that are still already you know, on the road. But every car we buy or sell today is, will be on the road for, in Norway, approximately 18 years on average. So they will pollute for 18 years more more if you buy a ice, new ice car today. So that's what we have to change and we have to change that as fast as possible and that's what the Norwegian politicians wants to do. So this goal is absolutely reachable. I think the biggest challenge going forward is getting the infrastructure in, in place fast enough but we're doing a lot to, to, to sort of do that in Norway now and I'll say a little bit about that as well. And next slide please. Yeah, I, I think we can jump this one. It's, we don't have time, I think. Um, I also uh, wanted to show you, uh, click one more. Um, we have, uh, we do a yearly survey. Um, I think maybe Ellen and the Dutch EV drivers have been inspired by us as well when it comes to doing surveys. We had uh, 14,000 respondents, EV drivers, in our last uh, survey, and 94% say that they are satisfied or very satisfied with being an EV driver. And that tells me that when you make it possible for people to choose an EV, it's, uh, it's um, something people will do. Next slide, please. Yeah, so a little bit about charging, next slide. Today we have uh, a situation where um, charging and investments in charging are really speeding up. We even have examples like this from uh, last year where one of the petrol station chains in Norway actually decided to replace some gas pumps with the with, uh, pass chargers. Uh, next slide, please. And the, the, the purchase of, or the sales of uh, petrol and diesel has come down the last three years with 10% in Norway. Um, so it's quickly changing now. And we just got the news this week that it seems that Norway is going to reach our climate reduction goals in 2020, which we really didn't think we would, but it, to a large degree because of the change uh, of our vehicle fleet. Today, 10% of all passenger cars on the roads in Norway are full electric. And that is starting to show on the statistics when it comes to fuel cells and, and CO2. Uh, the, the less CO2 emissions. We have around 2,650 fast chargers. We are mostly focusing on that because people can mostly charge at home, but of course in the cities we also need to have um, charging in apartment buildings, etc. But people do go on longer trips a lot in Norway to the mountains uh, on trips, and etc. 
and it's become a in really interesting uh, area to invest in. So we have more, the last few years, we've gone from five to 10 fast charging operators and loads of companies that wants to, to sort of build charging in apartment building, buildings, et cetera. So it's difficult in the beginning because you have that chicken and egg situation with charging in cars. But today in Norway with 300,000 EVs on the road, this is not an issue anymore. Now it's more uh, a race and a lot of uh, companies that want to invest in charging. And that tells me that the charging you see issue is less of a difficulty going forward uh, in, in the rest of the world as well. As well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, we also have a, ch a situation with queues. Um, it's uh, pre a lot of people that experience queues at fast charging stations. 2018, 58%, it went up to 64% 2019. But as I told you, we had 800 more fast chargers in Norway built the last year. And now people feel that it's a little bit better. But next slide, um, we are pretty uh, anxious about this summer because it will be a real EV summer uh, because er all, suddenly all Norwegians because of COVID-19 will, will be in Norway for their vacation instead of traveling south or, or something like that. And one out of two EV drivers are planning to take their EV on vacation in Norway this summer. So we are uh, anxious and it will be a, a big stress test of our infrastructure uh, and we're curious to see how this works out. Okay, next slide. I think I'm um, pretty much uh, finished. I just thought I'd tell you about a webinar that we are doing on Thursday uh, with uh, two really important people. The head of ASEA, which is the organization of uh, car manufacturers in Europe, and Miriam Dali, which is the EU parliamentarian that has sort of been heading, spearheading the stricter restrictions uh, uh, directed at, at um, car uh, manufacturers in, in Europe, uh, the policy, stricter policies. And they will be uh, with us at a webinar on Thursday. And I'll, I'll probably share the link on my LinkedIn page after this webinar if you, if you want to register and, and join that webinar as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina. So next we have um, Alistair Hamilton from Scotland. Hello from Edinburgh. Um, my name is Alistair Hamilton. Thanks for the introduction and thanks to Ellen and Christina. Um, very much in, in the same vein, EVA Scotland are uh, associated with um, electric vehicles and support the electrification of transport in general. Um, so very much like Christina's point. So perhaps we can go to the next slide. So Scotland has a, a policy position from the, from the Scottish government, which is a devolved government. Um, and they want to take the lead in promoting the use of ultra low emission vehicles and phase out the need for new petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2032. So very similar to the target that Christina mentioned, but the Norwegian target is 2025, whereas the Scottish one is 2032. Um, and this is ahead of the, the current UK uh, government target, which is 2040, although that's um, subject to um, review at the moment. Uh, so that may come forward to 2035 for the rest of the UK. But at the moment, Scotland's got a target of 2032. So next slide. So as an association, we've been feeding into the Scottish Government for a number of years on policy uh, and trying to push um, that, that date uh, and, and perhaps the reasons for that date. So the Scottish Government, not really through our pushing, I don't suppose entirely, but have come out with a series of targets. So you can see the 2032 date in the middle of that, that list. And this year, there's a target for generating 100% of Scotland's electricity demand from renewables. That's not to say that there are not other forms of electricity generation in Scotland. For example, um, nuclear in particular is, is quite large, but there's no coal generating plant anymore in Scotland. Those plants have closed down over the last few years. Um, and, and the way the Scottish Government are pushing the targets is they're trying to push out into the public sector fleet, first of all. So there's a date of 2025 to phase out the need for new petrol or diesel vehicles in that fleet. Um, so that's 
um, ahead of the overall target of 2032. And while we support the electrification of uh, vehicles, we also support the electrification of other forms of, of transport. And we're delighted to say that the Scottish Government have got a, a 2035 target for decarbonising Scotland's railways and a 2040 target for the Highlands and Islands, which is the um, vast land mass uh, um, above the main population centre to be the world's first net zero aviation region. And on top of all that, we've got the 2045 net zero carbon emission target from all from the Scottish Government. So that's kind of the policy background in, in which we are operating. Next slide, please. So if we look at the resource base that Scotland has, um, we, all the countries represented tonight are um, border onto the North Sea, um, if you think about the geography. Um, and Scotland is a European country and has 25% of the European wind resource, for example. 25% of the European tidal resource also. Um, so at the moment, there are a lot, lot of wind farms, both onshore and uh, increasingly offshore um, around the UK uh, and Scotland. And Scotland also generates some energy from its, its tidal resource. Um, and that's from a narrow stretch of water between the north of the mainland and the Orkney Isles, the Pentland Firth. Um, so that's happening at the moment. And, and that's going to increase over time. Um, additionally, we, Scotland does 10% of the European wave energy resource. Uh, it's got a, a much larger capacity to generate renewable energy than is being used at the moment, about 10 times um, the exist, existing peak domestic demand. We're also um, an oil producer and a natural gas producer um, and, and home to some top universities and a highly educated workforce. Okay, next slide, please. So if we look at um, what cars are selling um, at the moment, we've managed to pull out, the data is a little bit difficult to get hold of, but um, we can pull out e Scottish EV registrations as part of the, the UK database, if you like. So over last year, there were about two and a half thousand pure EVs, so battery electric EVs registered in Scotland. That's about one and a half percent of car registrations. Um, and rushing into the lead last year was the Tesla Model 3. So 687 of those sold last year, displacing the Nissan Leaf from what had been top spot. Um, so you can see that list there it also includes the UK made Jaguar I-Pace. Um, and on the right of that slide, we've got Francis Galashin uh, with his I-Pace um, outside his garage in Edinburgh. Okay, so next slide. So <clears throat> the, the bottom six, if you like, also include another couple of um, Teslas in there, the Model S and the Model X, so not selling as uh, well as the Model 3. Um, and we can see the Kia Niro and the Hyundai Ioniq misspelt there. Um, so these are the top selling EVs in Scotland at the moment. Next slide. So what are the incentives um, that are in place? Well, they're a mixture of uh, UK level incentives and Scottish incentives, just because of the way the um, government of Scotland works. So there's a plug-in grant available for electric vehicles, including not only cars and vans, but motorcycles, mopeds, taxis, and even large trucks. So that's around about £3,000 for new electric cars, um, £8,000 for electric vans. In Scotland, there's an interest-free loan of £35,000 for eligible cars, £10,000 for electric motorcycles or scooters, and that's a great incentive. Um, the vehicle excise duty uh, for pure battery electric vehicles um, is exempt. So there's no what we call road tax um, for vehicles up to a purchase price of £40,000. And you can get £800 towards the installation of a smart charge point. Uh, typically costing £1,000 in Scotland. There's also um, a tax called Benefit in Kind, uh, where you buy, you make use of a, a company car for personal pur uh, purposes, and that's um, exempt also for pure electric cars starting this year. Uh, and that's quite a, a good incentive compared to those uh, taxes for high emission vehicles. 
Next slide. So the charging infrastructure uh, in Scotland is uh, the pre predominant charging infrastructure is the Charge Play Scotland network, which is put in by the Scottish government. Uh, these figures are a little bit old. There, there are certainly more than 250 kilowatt chargers on the road network and well over a thousand destination chargers, that's seven or 22 kilowatt chargers. Um, the, the, uh, the network comprises a number of different hosts and there are different tariffs uh, depending on the host. And that network is expanding rapidly. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, a typical journey from Dumfries in the south to Thurso in the north and all the rapid charge points on that network from a number of different providers, not just Chargeplay Scotland, but Tesla, Instavolt, Engine, Ecotricity, etc. Next slide. So part of the um, push on this has been to put in uh, charging hubs and, and the one on the left is in Falkirk near the football stadium and you can see there's a mixture of solar um, and, and, and charge solar canopy and chargers there and we're seeing these crop up in places like Dundee, Kilmarnock, Falkirk um, as the network grows um, and this is part of what's called the electric A9. Uh, we've got this very romantic br branding um, for that major route going from the central belt of Scotland right up to the far north. Next slide. So what do EVA Scotland do? Um, we do a lot of promotion. So these are um, a number of scenes from our scrapbook, if you like, um, where we presented um, from small gatherings um, top right in Linlithgow to larger gatherings bottom left, which is the um, EVS um, show in Lyon, uh, where we, I, cha I chaired a panel of um, people discussing electric vehicles, including the um, Deputy Mayor of Amsterdam. Um, and some of you may know Robert Llewellyn from the Fully Charged show. He's one of our honorary members. Um, and you can see a number of our directors in those shots. So in particular, Elna Chalmers, who's perhaps known to viewers of Fully Charged. She was at Fully Charged in Texas. Um, uh, in, in the last year. So we do a lot of promotion ourselves but we also support um, Scottish Government uh, promotion activities so we go to things like the Evolution Show um, and, and Energy Saving Trust uh, promoted events and we find that by getting people into cars and experiencing them and driving them um, and sticking their head under the bonnet then th we get more conversions to, to pure electric vehicles. Also the reassurance of being, be able, being able to speak to a driver's association uh, and speaking to people who've actually experienced electric vehicles um, gives people the confidence. And our website eva.scot has a forum on which people can ask questions, for example. Um, you may notice that we've been photobombed in one of those pictures there by a very a dirty looking vehicle. So that's the Bowness um, historic railway line there uh, in the background. Okay, so last slide, I think. So um, we are a membership organization and we're welcome, we welcome members from all over the world. In fact, we, Dennis is on the, on the call, who's one of our members from um, California. So we have members all over um, the world. So if you would like to join and support what we do, then go to EVA Scott and you can sign up. If you become a full paying member, we'll send you out a, a membership pack. I know Dennis got his recently and has been tweeting about it with some lovely photographs. So you're welcome to join us. You're welcome to drop me an email or even give me a call if there's any questions we can't answer at the moment. And with that, I'll pass you back to Joel. Great. Well, thank, uh, thank you all for um, those really interesting presentations. I'm going to invite all of our panelists to um, turn your cameras back on and rejoin us. We have um, a number of questions from our audience, so I want to um, pose some of those questions to you all. Um, one um, question that we got, and, and I'll pose this to all three of you, is um, do you have any special incentives for lower income drivers to purchase a used EV? Um, and do you have many used EVs for sale and how affordable are they? So um, I'll let any of you uh, take that question. Maybe I can just jump in there first. 
in that we don't yet in Scotland, but I know we are getting something soon. Um, and that may well be in the form of a, an interest fee loan in order for people to purchase um, electric vehicles. We also have a very vibrant second hand market. One of our members, Jonathan Porterfield, again, very famous on social media, um, has a business ecocars.net that provides a service whereby he will deliver an electric vehicle, second hand electric vehicle sourced um, for your particular requirements to the purchaser's door. I can also say a little bit about this. Um, sometimes I think that we have to change that question a little bit because um, we we cannot start with with secondhand cars. We have to start with the new ones. And who buys the new cars? Those are people that are not low income. That's the same with ICE cars as well. In Norway, three out of four cars that are sold every year are secondhand. So most most people do not buy a new car. But we have to sort of uh, change the new cars that are, are chosen and, and try and use the poli politics that to sort of change that. So with a car, making the car with the EV uh, cheaper to buy as the first, uh, as a new car, that price will follow the car down the chain. So when it's available after a few years, because they're oft, often new cars are often sold on uh, after two, th three, four years, then this car is available in the second-hand market for lower income groups, or most people really. So, uh, so that's, that's how we have to look at it, uh, in my opinion. And now we have a pretty large growing second-hand uh, market in Norway for EVs. And uh, the only challenge is that still most of the cars that are available there are, uh, are, not, are not necessarily cars with the longest range, although that's sl slightly changing as well. Uh, so we more we definitely need more cheaper cars that are typical family cars of a certain size and good range. Um, but there are also newer EVs that are affordable for not very low income groups because they don't necessarily even buy a car. Uh, they use the public transport. Uh, but, uh, but we have Renault Zoe, for example. We have also different new Chinese brands available that are cheaper priced. And why when new cars are, are taxed really heavily, buying a new car in Norway is really expensive in general. So, um, so I sometimes find that question a little bit, well, uh, you have to start with the new cars to, to succeed. Uh, and then you have to sort of use the policies directed at that, and then slowly it will get available for everyone. Yes, I think I, uh, I agree that because most of the sales in, at least in the Netherlands, uh, are new. I mean, I think about 90% of, uh, in our last charging survey, the people had a new car. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned, you know, that from the 1st of July, our Dutch government is going to uh, subsidize or give a rebate to private, uh, privately owned cars. And that subsidy is especially also targeted for people that um, want to buy a secondhand car. And um, we've got a, a strong secondhand car market. And so, of course, there's also a secondhand car market for the EVs. But um, I agree. I mean, there's so many new models coming in. And so we first, you know, need to uh, sell them and that they will come into the, the market anyhow. And I've, I've lost, I don't, I think one month ago, I saw this Chinese car that you can buy from Alibaba in a box. It only costs about a thousand dollars. I mean, this car is electric. So I think the prices will change uh, and, and, you know, be, be less um, with the, within the next couple of years. But for now, I think uh, our subsidy for a used car is, um, is good to set up a sort of a market. And especially in these times, in the COVID times, when people want to sort of have an extra secondhand car, that might be a possibility. Um, another question that we uh, received is, um, can you tell us a little bit about electrification of vans and medium to heavy duty trucks um, in each of your countries? Are there many larger vehicles on the road and are there targets? I'll open that up to anybody. Who wants to go first? Uh, maybe I can go in first. Um, Certainly, we, we see a number of delivery vehicles uh, ad adopting um, elect electric uh, means. So, for example, in the public sector, um, 
the our national health service, which has been under a lot of strain recently um, with the pandemic, um, you see a, a number of um, electric vans <clears throat> in their fleet. Also, uh, we have another member who does um, organic uh, food deliveries. And that, again, that's by um, electric vans. Um, I would say that there's not yet sufficient um, electric vans on the market to satisfy um, your average tradesman who dr might drive a white van uh, in order to go about his business. So, but, but if that's beginning to change, that's coming. Um, there's it's still a bit slow, but it's really happening a lot in this area as well. As I showed you, not 7% of uh, new smaller vans that are sold are now full electric, but they still, we still need more, uh, uh, heavy well when you look at uh, small small vans longer range cars but it's actually the couple, a couple of next years we will have more to choose from and uh, i just last week i think it was i was contacted by a pretty big company here in norway with 500 cars in their fleet and they're planning to change them all into evs uh, the next two years and they already had planned uh, these are models that are, are will be available next two years that they, they are planning to buy. So I think that it will go a lot faster when it comes to look at uh, light commercial vehicles because they have a shorter life uh, lifespan as well uh, than no, instead not like in um, private uh, cars. Uh, we're also seeing more uh, focus on, on delivery trucks and, and bigger trucks as well um, and with the maritime sector Norway builds uh, ferries and ships uh, by the end of 2021 we will have around 80 electric ferries in Norway we already have several uh, here in Oslo on the west coast car ferries full electric uh, with heavy charging each side of the fjord like 350 kilowatt charging uh, systems uh, there are also a lot focus on aviation uh, Avinur, which is the Norwegian uh, airport, um, airport uh, sort of uh, official airport owner, they are planning to electrify all inland uh, aviation uh, by 2040, I think it is. And there's already concrete plans with shorter distance uh, flights with uh, electric. I've myself, I've been in an electric plane once. It was amazing uh, experience because it's a lot less, uh, not that um, no noisy. But yes, we need to, to see uh, um, more happening here, and, and I'm, but I'm sure it is the next few years. Um, for us, um, uh, we've got about 15% of our buses is electric, and I think in 2025, our aim is to have 75% of all the buses um, uh, being electric, so this, this is one of an, uh, one of the most important goals. And as you might know, we've got some those low emission zones in the cities. So there is an urgent need for sort of uh, city transport vans, electric ones, and there's a, a short a shortage of models. So there's a um, high demand for that. And um, I think, especially with those low emission zones, um, if you need to sort of um, uh, get your get your stuff into the the city. Then you need those electric um, uh, transportation. So I think um, uh, we we're in a need for that. And we've got a big port of Rotterdam, and um, I know that they're you know they want to be sort of the most sustainable port uh, as soon as possible. And um, I know that there's a fully electric terminal as well, and they want to uh, expand that as well. So I think there's a lot of focus on the heavy and light duty as well. Um, another question, and we're getting a ton of great questions, so I apologize that there's no way we can get to all of them, but um, um, another question is, can EV adoption increase without incentives, and how can we convince our respective leaders to realize the importance and scientific evidence of global warming, and how EVs can play a large part in its reduction? Maybe I can jump in again here first. I think in, in Scotland, we've been quite lucky in that um, well, we have a good renewables base, so kind of switching things to, to electric becomes um, a, a sensible national strategy. So um, as part of what we do, we're, we're continually uh, interfacing with government. So at the Scottish government level and occasionally at the UK government level and occasionally even at the EU level. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, we have a very receptive government in, in Scotland in that regard. 
um, and they strive to be ahead of the game. So I think the, you know, the, the, the thing is to lobby your politicians and try and get your point of view across uh, as strongly as you can. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, our European nations are, are, are quite progressive in that regard. And obviously the political situation will be different um, where everyone else is. So, uh, but I think all you can do is push hard uh, and be a, a positive voice uh, to try and achieve the transition. I think for the US with your current president and everything, I think maybe the most important uh, argument to make right now is that put the climate argument away and talk about the economics. What is happening now with China and also Europe uh, really, I mean, it's, it's, we are facing a total paradigm shift when it comes to transport. So uh, when you talk about not selling anything else than EVs in 2040, that's not a goal in my opinion. And uh, that's like UK are saying, for example, because nobody will manufacture an ICE car in 2040. Nobody will buy it and wants to, want to buy something else in 2040. These cars will be cheaper, better, and those who are not focusing on this shift right now, economically wise, they're going to lose the game. And that was what Europe was about to do. Europe did not focus on battery man fact factories. They did not focus on, on creating a, their own market. The German car makers were too slow at realizing what was happening. And China is going for it now. We already have a couple of Chinese uh, cars available in Norway uh, for the first time ever. People are buying them and they're gonna come in heaps. They're already all over the world with their buses. So China has been really clever and smart and are gonna succeed. And the US, apart from Tesla, I mean, Trump and everyone should understand that if they're gonna be in this market in the future, they need to act now, help grow their whole market, focus on charging infrastructure and get their car manufacturers to move their asses. You're here. <laughs> I think you were completely right. And, but I think if you look at, at it at a more practical side as well, what we saw in the Netherlands is, well, I think it's still not a mature market. So, um, but it is soon going to be. So there's so many developments. But what we saw, for example, in the Netherlands is once you skip the subsidies, it immediately has an effect on the market. So if your question is, should we, uh, what was your question? Should we sort of in, uh, um, incentivize the, the, the EV market? I think um, it, it helps now. So it helps, and I think the Netherlands is doing it now because they want to have a front runner's position uh, in the next couple of years. So you should focus as a country on the new sustainable uh, mobility. Um, and in that way, I think it's smart to sort of uh, subsidize it, and, but uh, change is going to come anyway. Uh, on the light, uh, right side of the, or the lane, or the left side of the lane, it doesn't matter, it will be there soon. No, Christina, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that's kind of the message that we put out to automakers. And when we're talking, particularly in auto manufacturing states, is this is like, does the U.S. want to be manufacturing cars in 10 years or 20 years? You know, this isn't just for them. It's not just about environment. It's about this whole industry that's going to go away uh, if we don't jump up and get really serious. Otherwise, we're going to be buying all our cars from, from Germany and China because they're very serious. And if you're in you know, uh, Michigan or Ohio, uh, you need to be paying attention to that or you're not going to have car factories and, and you're going to lose that whole sector of the economy. So that's, that's part of our messaging, absolutely. Yeah, and it's actually, um, I'm quite happy now to see that in Europe, uh, investments into this is now really uh, speeding up and uh, uh, a lot of battery factors are uh, on the drawing board, even here in Norway, um, and uh, a lot more happening. But uh, I think what China has really uh, done well, uh, and Tesla obviously is is also all is not just about manufacturing electric cars, but it's, it's all about the connectivity, digitalization, the smartness, the software, which uh, the German car makers has uh, had problems with. Uh, the ID3 is is delayed because of it, and uh, but they're moving ahead, and we'll see. And uh, it's uh, a complete toss around with the whole uh, car um, market uh, globally, which is going to see look dif completely different in a few years. We're going to see big bankruptcies. 
new play even more new players and uh, there's a really interesting uh, game changer that is happening which is quite fun to, to follow yeah and i think uh, um uh, to elaborate a bit on that one what you can see even in china and i think um in our countries and uh, i don't know in california but what you see is that uh, uh, normal you know fossil cars sales drop and ev cars sales don't drop you know there's something happening now and that you can see on a, on a small scale, but that will be a sort of the sign of, I think, what is going to change in the next couple of coming years. Absolutely. Well, thank you all. We're coming up on the top of the hour, so I know we need to, uh, I'm sure we could talk about this for hours more, but um, I'm, I'm afraid we're gonna have to um, end it there. So I wanna thank all three of our presenters. I wanna thank Ellen and uh, Christina and Alistair for joining us from your respective countries and giving us your input. Um, and I will just uh, turn over to Joel in case you have any last parting words. No, this is really great. I, I really appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, it was obviously well received. We had a huge number of people on the phone. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, well, I'm really excited about the, uh, the EV drivers network across the globe and I look forward to working with you all more in the future and to building up the voice of EV drivers uh, in these discussions as we move, go forward and move to an all electric future. So thank you all. And thanks everyone for joining us. Sending you all thank the you. best in the US. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye from Scotland. Bye-bye.